bring it all together into, into some kind of conclusion. What happens when we die? Nobody knows the answer to this question, surely. Many, we, we're all going to ask ourselves this question at some point in our lives because it's fundamental to the human condition. Uh, and it's surely a big question. Uh, do we just stop or, or do we go on in some way? And we may bring to this question our religious beliefs that, that we may have developed as adults or that may have been drummed into us from childhood. Uh, or science may condition our thinking on this question. Lots of different reasons why we would think about it in many, many different ways. And I'm sure there's as many different views on the subject in this room as there are people in the room. But this man, Richard Dawkins, the professor of the history of science at Oxford University, or at least so he was until recently, um, he knows the answer to what happens to us when we die. Um, because um, he was asked this question, um, how do you, talk about a leading question, how do you prepare for death in a world where there isn't a God? And he replies, you prepare for it by facing up to the truth, which is that life is what we have, and so we had better live our life to the full. I can't object to that. I totally agree. We should live this magnificent gift of life to the full. But then he says, we had better live our life to the full while we have it because there is nothing after it. And what I want to know is, how does Richard Dawkins know that? <laughs> what science is that based on? What experiment? What weighing or measuring counting? What has Dawkins done that he knows there is nothing after death? Has he died? Been there, found nothing, explored nothing, <laughs> come back, reported on it. No, he hasn't. And actually, what Dawkins is doing here, he is expressing his own, I would say, very narrow, very limited religious belief. This is a religious belief that there is no life after death. It's an act of faith. There is no evidence for that belief. It is not a scientific fact. It's just his point of view. But because he's this esteemed professor with a, who wrote The Selfish Gene, for goodness sake, background in genetics, people tend to buy this and say, oh gosh, yes, Dawkins says there's no life after death, and so there must be no life after death. Well, really, how do we know that? You know, What is this thing called death? Is this widely used legal definition, complete cessation of brain function as evidenced by absence of brainwave activity on an electroencephalogram? <laughs> well, I would say we are not our brains. We are our consciousness. You know, we're not our knees either, or our elbows, or our shoulders. We, we, what we are, what all of us, every one of us in this room is, is a spark of light, a spark of consciousness. We are our consciousness. And yes, certainly the brain is involved in consciousness in some vital way, but it's unclear exactly how. And this was the first area that I got into trouble with Ted for my brief TED talk, which was on their website for a couple of weeks before they took it off. And, and I couldn't initially understand why they'd taken it off, but it later became clear that there is a faction of scientists who advise TED who belong to what is called the materialist reductionist tendency, that they believe that all phenomena can be reduced to matter, that there is nothing outside the material realm, eff effectively nothing that can't be weighed, measured, or counted. And to suggest that consciousness might in some way be non-local to the brain, cannot be reduced to the brain, cannot be localized to the brain, is a kind of act of heresy from the point of view of this faction of scientists, who, amongst whom whose number is Richard Dawkins. Now, there's the question, does the brain make consciousness the way a generator makes electricity? That is the view of the reductionist tendency in science, that all our consciousness is Actually, they call it an epiphenomenon of brain activity. It's actually a kind of accident that we have consciousness at all. Because what, from their point of view, what our brains are there to do is to help us. It's all about survival of the fitti fittest. It's about Darwinian um, uh, competition. And our brains have evolved to enable us to be incredible survivors in this material realm. And as an accidental byproduct of this, we've got this annoying thing called consciousness. And therefore, since our brains make our consciousness, it follows, if you hold that point of view, that when our brains are dead, flatline on the ECG, consciousness is gone. There's nothing left. It's over. Our story is over. We are just meat. We are reduced to matter. And there is nothing more to us, and, and it's over. If you hold that point of view, you cannot possibly believe 
in life after death? How could there be life after death? How could the consciousness survive death when your brain is dead? Doesn't make sense. Um, and such things as near-death experiences, um, or indeed uh, uh, other issues that suggest non-local character of consciousness, like, like um, out-of-body out of experiences, telepathy, all such things must be fantasies. There can be no reality to them from the reductionist point of view. But there's another possibility if we're in this realm of, of analogies, which is that the relationship of consciousness to the brain might be more like the relationship of the TV signal to the TV set. And again, I got into trouble with Ted even for suggesting this and, and for saying, and I stick by this, that there is nothing in neuroscience that rules this out. See, the materialist scientist will say, I know your brain makes your consciousness because if I damage this or that area of your brain, this or that area of your consciousness will blink out. It will be gone. Therefore, that proves that your brain made that bit of your consciousness. But isn't that true with the TV analogy too? If you damage the TV screen, the picture won't be quite so good, will it? But the TV signal will still be there. The signal will still be perfect. And, and there's, there's nothing that I'm aware of in neuroscience that rules out this possibility, that the brain is actually a transceiver of consciousness rather than a generator of consciousness. The brain is the interface between a non-material and a material realm through which consciousness manifests on this plane. And, and I mean, this is broadly the view uh, of all spiritual traditions. So I think any reasonable person should be willing to admit, admit that what we're looking at here is a 50-50 is shot. You know, we don't know. We just don't know. We live after death. We don't live after death. 50-50. And then we have all this other stuff. You know, the, 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 the ghosts, the spirits, the near-death experience. What about reincarnation? What about Ian Stevens' work at the University of Virginia? 15 years trying to disprove reincarnation. At the end of the day, he has to conclude the only way he can explain the evidence is that reincarnation occurs. Well, reincarnation can't occur if your brain makes consciousness. It can if your brain is manifesting consciousness temporarily, if you're wearing this body, this brain, like a, like a suit of, of clothes. Um, none of this an anomalous data is explained by the mainstream paradigm. And I think if we take that anomalous data into account, then suddenly the balance shifts just a little bit from 50-50. I think it becomes like 51-49, you know? Um, if we're reasonable, in favor of some kind of conscious survival of death rather than, rather than the end uh, when we are reduced to meat. At any rate, if we want to know what happens after death, the very last people we should discuss this with are materialist scientists because they say, quite simply, nothing happens after death. End of story, there's nothing more to discuss. I think it's interesting to look at the views of wise ancient civilizations like the ancient Egyptians. Uh, the ancient Egyptians, after all, put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on the mystery of life after death. They didn't put their best minds to work on making computers or soap powder or cars. They put their best minds to work on what happens to us when we die. And they came to very definite and specific conclusions, which they expressed in the most amazing and, and uh, beautiful uh, symbolic art, which touches the soul uh, to this day. Uh, my wife, Santa, took this photograph as a deliberate double exposure. It shows the Great Pyramid in the background. And here in the foreground, uh, the tomb chamber, so-called tomb chamber of the Pyramid of Unas, a pharaoh of the late Fifth Dynasty. Now, the Great Pyramid is completely uninscribed, but the Fourth Dynasty, but the pyramids of the Fifth Dynasty are richly inscribed with hieroglyphs, and, and they also have these lovely starry uh, ceilings. The fact that no body of any pharaoh was ever found buried in any pyramid is just one of those annoying little things that Egyptologists pass over. Um, but let's call it a tomb chamber. And uh, here we have the hieroglyphs on the wall. And those hieroglyphs are beautiful to behold. Uh, and they contain what are called the pyramid texts. The pyramid texts are the oldest of the texts that we know better today as the Book of the Dead, the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. 
Uh, in fact, it's a continuous liturgy that passes through the whole 3,000-year story of ancient Egypt. And the oldest texts are the pyramid texts, so-called because they're carved on the walls of the pyramids. Then you have the coffin texts written inside coffin lids. Uh, then you have the Book of the Dead uh, written on papyrus scrolls buried with the mummy. Uh, and you also have the Book of what is in the Duat. Go to the tomb of Thutmose III in the Valley of the Kings, for example. Take a walk around the tomb chamber there, and you'll see the whole text of the book of what is in the Duat on the walls. What all these texts do is, they, they're a bit like the Tibetan Book of the Dead. They provide the deceased with a kind of guide to the afterlife realm, which was called the Duat, the place through which we will be required to journey after death. And that journey is not going to be easy. It's better to be prepared for it. It's better to be ready for this afterlife journey, which unfolds at some level in a region of the sky, because the Duat is a celestial realm, and at some level in a three-dimensional underworld with corridors and passageways. This is how it's described. And you might have Anubis, the psychopomp, as your guide uh, through the underworld. And you will confront monsters and terrors and fiends along the way and gates. And you're going to need to know the passwords to get through those gates. All of this is richly symbolic. You are going to live out the consequences of your own life in the journey through the Duat. Uh, and that is, um, uh, th that, that is something to really reflect on deeply as far as the ancient Egyptians were concerned. My colleague Robert Boval, in his wonderful book, The Orion Mystery, published in 1994, first, I think, really drew proper attention to this. And Robert and I, working together on the message of the Sphinx in 1996, using computer software to wind back the ancient skies, showed that in 10,500 BC, this astonishing as above, so below correlation occurs at Giza, where you have Orion lying due south on the horizon at the exact moment the sun bisects the eastern horizon at dawn on the spring equinox. Constellation of Leo in the sky uh, above uh, housing the sun at that time. And even the Nile River seeming to match the Milky Way uh, in, in, in the heavens. This is the region of the sky called the Duat. And the suggestion is that the what we're looking at at Giza was the Duat built on the ground, a kind of three-dimensional simulator for the place through which the soul would travel after death, and, and a hidden circle in the sky because it's hidden in time. I don't think it's possible to understand the Great Pyramid of Giza without reference to the pyramid texts of the later dynasties and to the books of the dead. And I don't think it's possible to understand those texts without reference to the Great Pyramid. Uh, so here is the internal uh, system of the Great Pyramid with the subterranean chamber far below ground here, 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the Great Pyramid. And I'll just take you on a quick journey around it. That's the subterranean chamber hewn out of solid bedrock beneath the Great Pyramid. Um, and uh, that's how it looks today, of course, but that's how it looked at the turn of the 19th, early 20th century, a much more terrifying place when not lit up by nice little electric lights. Although I must say, Santha and I have been cut off down there when the power was cut uh, on our own, and uh, it is an amazing experience to be alone in the subterranean chamber in complete darkness, and a kind of light seems to come out of the walls after a while. I don't know, maybe I was hallucinating, but it was just, <laughs> it was just amazing. Um, rather more scary uh, before it was tidied up. Uh, and uh, coming up that passageway from the subterranean chamber, the so-called descending corridor, three feet five inches high, three feet five inches wide, uh, we find that there's a hole in the wall on the left-hand side here. And that hole in the wall leads to the well shaft, which actually joins up at the foot of the Grand Gallery here. Uh, quite an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, coming on up here, we're now going to go up the ascending corridor. There it is. Uh, until the junction with the horizontal corridor that leads to the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery uh, that goes on up to the so-called King's Chamber. By the way, these names, King's Chambers, Queen's Chamber, they have no uh, re ancient reference whatsoever. They're just made up by um, Egyptologists. They, they don't relate to anything. Uh, so there is, the, there is that junction point. Go along this corridor horizontally. You'll get into this chamber here, the so-called Queen's Chamber. Go up there you'll come to the king's chamber. 
uh, and that's the corridor into the Queen's Chamber. That's the Queen's Chamber itself. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into these sneaky little holes in the wall that uh, lead to shafts that uh, just don't emerge on the outside of the pyramid, uh, but have been explored with, uh, with robots. Um, there's the Grand Gallery now. We're going to go up here. That's how it looks today. Nice little handrails at the side. But that's how it looked in the 19th century. Uh, disappearing up into this kind of Stygian gloom, a rather terrifying place to be. Uh, I do love this picture, um, this Victorian lady standing there at the antechamber into the, into the king's chamber, just reminding us that whenever, when we do visit the Great Pyramid, we are passing through history. Uh, it's, it stands, it never changes, it's always the same, it's us who change. Um, and there is the uh, king's chamber itself, uh, the heart of the matter, uh, granite blocks inside this limestone monument. Uh, it's not an accident that Giza was called Rostau in the ancient texts, uh, because uh, Rostau uh, was um, the fifth division of the Duat, this place that you travel through in the underworld. Uh, and it seems that Giza, with its sphinx, with its pyramids, is indeed a, a model of the, of the Duat. Uh, and we can see references in the various images of the Duat to the chambers in the Great Pyramid, the Grand Gallery here. Uh, there's even a boat buried beside the Great Pyramid, and boats were the prime means of navigation through the Duat. Uh, and, and the most important place in the Duat is what's called the Judgment Hall of Osiris, or the Hall of Mart, uh, often approached up a sloping corridor, rather like the Grand Gallery. And that's what I would suggest was the function of the King's Chamber. Not for the burial of a pharaoh. This sarcophagus was not for that purpose. It had a ritual function. It was used in initiation ceremonies, uh, undoubtedly involving altered states of consciousness. At any rate, when you enter into the Hall of Mart, which is also called the Judgment Hall of Osiris, um, your life has been your opportunity to prepare for this really scary and worrying moment. The goddess Mart wears the feather on her headdress. That feather uh, symbolizes cosmic justice, truth. And we see it again in these scales here. There's the feather of Mart. And in the other scale is this little symbol, which represents the soul of the deceased. So your soul is being weighed in the scales against the feather of truth and cosmic justice. And up here, here's the 42 negative assessors in the Judgment Hall of Osiris. Why are they called the negative assessors? Each of them is going to ask you a question. Did you kill? Did you steal? Did you bear false witness? Actually, all of the Ten Commandments are there, and 32 others as well. And ideally, in a perfect world, you should be able to answer no to all of those questions. But the ancient Egyptians understood that we are frail, that we are fragile, that we make mistakes. There's room in the ancient Egyptian system, there's room in a human life to learn from our mistakes and not to repeat them, ideally, to learn our lessons as we go through life. I often think that the ancient Egyptians looked at the human life rather like a work of art, rather like a sculpture. And we would work on this sculpture. We would get whatever we got. Might be 20, might be 50, might be 70, might be 90 years, who knows how long, to work on the sculpture that is our lives. We would make mistakes, but we would chip away and try and fix those mistakes, make things better, improve them. So that the object being at the end of it, that you should be able to stand back and look back on the long course of your life and say, yes, I did go wrong there, and I did make that mistake, but, but I put it right. And by and large, on balance, at the end of it all, I did good. This, this, would, be, this would be the objective. So there is a strong moral element in the judgment scene. Uh, but it's not all that is going on there by any means. Um, that's the other end of the judgment scene. There's Osiris uh, sitting in judgment. There's the hallucinogenic water lily, which we'll come to. Um, there is Amit, the eater of the dead. Uh, the ancient Egyptians believed in reincarnation. 
as I say, their, their view of human life was um, understanding of our frailty, but they also reckoned that there were certain things that a person could do impinging so violently on the sovereignty of others, um, acts of terrible wickedness and sin that, that would get us eaten by Amit, that we would not go on, we would face annihilation, we would not come back uh, to live again. So he's part of the judgment scene as well. Uh, and there, um, interestingly, testing the soul in the balance is not a judging, a testing of actions. The 42 assessors do that. It's the weighing of words and some kind of knowledge, some kind of gnosis is clearly implied here. This gnosis is not book learning. It's not stuff that you're going to go to university and study. It is a kind of revelation. It's, the question is, did you get it? You know, you were given this incredible opportunity to be born in a human body. The whole universe worked to that end to allow you to be born in a human body. You were there to do something. Did you get it? Did you get what you were there for? And uh, it's, that, it's that revelation that, that is, is really the point of all this. It's, it, the, the moral behavior is necessary but not sufficient. You, you, you need to get the point of your life. Um, and, and that point, the Tibetan Book of the Dead puts it this way, meditation, love, ethics, none of these alone can bring about enlightenment without wisdom. Um, the... the uh, the question is, how long have I to live? And, and, and when you're justified in the judgment, perhaps after passing through many lives, Thoth will reply, thou art for millions of years, a period of life of millions of years. And the ultimate apotheosis depicted here in the tomb of Thutmose III is to be reborn as a star, uh, to shed light and life throughout the universe. Again, all of this is richly uh, symbolic. Uh, but, but that is the generous conclusion of many, many human lifetimes. In their explorations of death and of the mystery of being alive, which is ultimately a spiritual mystery, and that question, did you get it? The answer is, I did get it. My life was not about being a material being. My life was about nurture, nurturing the spiritual part of myself. And in these explorations, there's no doubt that the ancient Egyptians used visionary plants. Certainly, I don't like this word narcotic that William Emberden uses here, but certainly the blue water lily. Uh, and most intriguingly, the ancient Egyptian tree of life, on which Thoth writes our names when we're justified in the judgment, turns out to be, according to my friend Dennis McKenna, uh, who is an ethnopharmacologist, um, Acacia nilotica. And lo and behold, what does Acacia nilotica contain in its bark but dimethyltryptamine, DMT? Now, some would say that it's a massive chemical operation to get the DMT out of the bark of Acacia nilotica. But where do we get the word chemistry from? Well, the ancient Egyptians called their land Kemet, and the Arabs called it al -Kempt. And that's what we get the word alchemy from. And that's what we get the word chemistry from. Certainly, the ancient Egyptians could have extra extracted the DMT from the bark of Acacia nilotica. Those who had held the wisdom of ancient Egypt for 3,000 years knew their story was over. And they needed to pass it down into a new incarnation. And two bodies of texts emerged, uh, written in the languages of, of Rome and Greece, in Roman, Ro Latin and Greek languages. And one of these were the Hermetic texts, where we read, souls have at stake in this life their hope of eternity in the life to come. Man's duty is not to acquiesce in his merely human state, but rather in the strength of his contemplation of things divine, to scorn and disguise that mortal part which has been attached to him, because it was needful that he should keep and tend the lower world. This is actually a central aspect of the ancient Egyptian texts, that we should not be attached to our material bodies, that we have to reach for the heavens, we have to reach for the skies, and that metaphorically means we have to reach for the spiritual part of ourselves, and the spiritual part of ourselves is damaged if we focus too much on the material part of ourselves. We are both material and spiritual creatures. We should never forget that our essence is spiritual. The other body of texts have a much more unforgiving view of this dualism, and that is the Gnostic texts, which we know about, thank goodness, because um, 
of the Nag, so-called Nag Hammadi library. Uh, there were, Gnosticism was integrated into early Christianity, but they were very different from the faction of Christianity that runs Christianity today. Uh, and they were persecuted. Uh, they were, the Gnostics were horrendously persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church uh, after the conversion of Constantine to Roman Catholicism. Story goes that Constantine um, was going around Rome looking for salvation. See, he had boiled his wife alive in a bath, and he had also killed his own son, and he was looking for salvation. But all of the many religions to be found in Rome, when he came to them, they said, sorry, Constantine, we can't do anything for you. You've gone too far. But there was a particular literal faction of Christianity that was to become the Roman Catholic Church, and they said, we can sort you out. <laughs> and uh, that, is, uh, that is how that particular faction of Christianity became the state religion of Rome. Of course, there's other stories around it as well, but that's broadly it. Immediately, they began to persecute those Christians who called themselves Gnostics, who believed in revealed knowledge, not in knowledge that was handed down to them by some priest. And uh, amazingly, one group of Gnostics buried in ceramic jars an entire library of their texts, pretty near the Temple of Dendera in Upper Egypt. It's just as well that they did that, otherwise we would only have known about Gnosticism through the words of those Catholics who attacked them for heresy. But since 1945, we've had the Nag Hammadi Library. In fact, the Egyptian peasant who found it, his mother actually used the first two codices as basically kindling in her stove. Uh, but then they realized the value of them. They got out onto the market. Now we have the Nag Hammadi Library translated into English. Anybody can read it. I highly recommend it. If these are revelatory texts, absolutely stunning and deeply, deeply disturbing. Uh, you've all read what I, I put up there. Ideas or coherent systems that are characterized by an absolutely negative view of the physical world, visible world and its creator, and the assumption of a divine spark in man, his inner self, which had become enclosed within the material body as a result of a tragic event in the pre-cosmic world from which it can only escape to its divine origins by means of the saving gnosis. So both Hermeticism and Gnosticism see reality in very starkly dualistic terms. There is the spiritual realm, that's God, and then there's the world, the physical realm, which is immured in in evil, and the two never can meet in these, in these dualistic systems. And this is why the Gnostics really got themselves into trouble. You know the film, The Usual Suspects. There's a line in that film, the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world he didn't exist. The Gnostics took it further than that. They say the greatest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that he is God. They say that the entity that we have been taught to worship as God, who, whether we call him Jehovah, Yahweh, God, Allah, whatever we call him, they say, no, that is not a God. That is some kind of minor, pumped up, supernatural, who wants to be adored and loved and worshipped, who's incredibly jealous, who's constantly telling people to slaughter one another, uh, that is not God. That's a kind of demon. They called him the Demiurge. And I, I don't have time to go into Gnostic cosmology here, but the Plerima, the All. Then you have the Aeons. One of the Aeons was Sophia. She fell from the fullness into matter. She created the Demiurge. The Demiurge created the world and human beings. And these things called Archons which are like evil angels that often take on human form and mingle with mankind and drive the poor wretches to all manner of crimes and wickedness. This is the Gnostic uh, scheme of things. Uh, and within us is this divine spark, and the purpose of the Gnostic revelation is to allow that divine spark to be liberated from matter. Uh, the Gnostics had a high opinion of Christ. Uh, they regarded him as a Gnostic teacher. I challenge you to find anywhere in any of the, the biblical texts any statement by Christ which tells people to burn other people at the stake. Christ does not say that, but the church did it very, very often. And from the Gnostic point of view, it was an absurd idea that Christ died for our sins. 
No, we're responsible for our own sins. We have to learn from them. You can't have somebody else go die for them. Uh, and he came in a time of darkness to help us find the necessary gnosis to escape the demiurgic realm. So from the Gnostic point of view, a number of biblical stories are told upside down. We've been taught that the serpent was the bad guy in the Garden of Eden, very bad guy. He tempted Eve to eat of what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was such a crime that Adam and Eve are, are, to, are to be driven out of the garden. Um, from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent is the good guy. It's essential that we eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We can't just be these robots living in the garden without any knowledge at all of right and wrong. We've got to learn from right and wrong. We've got to be able to make our own mistakes and, and take responsibility for them and own them. And in order to do that, yes, we have to have knowledge of good and evil. So heretical though it is, from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent is the good guy, and uh, this Yahweh is a kind of demon. Uh, and and uh, there we are, we're driven out of the garden, the angels beating upon our bottoms with swords, you know, and, and the angel post posted at the edge of the garden with a whirling sword to stop us ever eating of the tree of life. There's a very fascinating passage in the book of Genesis where this is considered, lest they, they can't let Adam and Eve back into the garden to eat, lest they eat of the tree of life and become gods like us. Who is saying that? Who is saying that in the, in, in, in the book of Genesis? Anyway, here's the tree of life. It's a mushroom. <laughs> this is uh, a Gnostic depiction of the tree of life uh, because Gnosticism did survive the persecutions in the, in, in the early time, uh, centuries of the Christian era and did manifest in various places. And, and we can see it's an Amanita muscaria uh, hallucinogenic visionary mushroom, which is, the, which is the tree of life. Think about that for a moment. According to the Gnostics, the flood was not inflicted to punish evil, as the Old Testament informs us, but to punish humanity for having risen so high and to take the light, the gnosis that was growing amongst men. The survivors were thrown into great distraction and into a life of toil so that mankind might be occupied with worldly affairs and might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the human spirit, to, to, to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and throughout history, those who've sought the liberating gnosis the light, the knowledge of the true nature of things have been persecuted. And a terrible persecution of a Gnostic sect took place here in southwestern France uh, between the years roughly the late 1100s into the 1200s. These were the Cathars. You can trace their intellectual history right back to the early Gnostic movements in the, in the Middle East. Uh, but in southwestern France, in the area called the Languedoc or Occitania, uh, they became a powerful force, uh, a force that rivaled Rome in some ways. Uh, but there, and they were amazing, the Cathars. I, I urge you to learn about the Cathars if you don't know about them, because they were so far ahead of their time. These were the, these were the people amongst whom the troubadours ar arose, these amazing songs of romance and beauty. Uh, they believed absolutely in the complete equality of men and women. Um, many of them were vegetarians uh, also. Um, they believed in universal literacy. They taught people to read. They, they made paper. Uh, they, they were so far ahead of their time, but they had one serious problem as far as the Church of Rome was concerned, and that is that they believed the Pope was the devil's agent on earth. <laughs> and uh, as a result, a crusade was declared against them, and this was the Albigensian Crusades, called Albigensian after Albi, one of the cities in the Languedoc, and this dreadful army, sort of seething with harm and murder, marched down on them from northern France, intent on utterly wiping out the Cathars. And when they came to Béziers, the abbot who was leading the crusade was asked, what shall we do about the Catholics who are living in Béziers? Because Catholics were living side by side with Cathars, perfectly peacefully. And the abbot said, kill them all. God will know his own. Uh, the slaughter of the Cathars began. Fi the final redoubt was at Monsigur in 12 1244. Uh, just a terrible series of events, burnings at the stake. This is when the Inquisition really got, got underway. Uh, terrible burnings at the stake, burning of Cathar literature, uh, an attempt to completely stamp out their, their knowledge. Imagine what it takes to burn a fellow human being at the stake. I mean, think about what you're doing to that person. 
Think of the horror that you're inflicting on them, the unbelievable pain, the terror, the awful, awful agony. And, and, and this is something that you're being called upon to do by your God. What kind of God is that that calls upon us to burn fellow human beings at the stake? So from the Gnostic point of view, the Demiurge and his archons and their human servants are always trying to steal the light we can be sure that tremendous iconic forces are working to suppress it. And if the Gnostic scenario were correct, then how might we expect those forces to manifest? And, um, well, this is one of the ways that I think we could expect those forces to manifest. Uh, the rabbis, the priests, the mullahs of the three monotheistic faiths who all worship Yahweh. Uh, who are jealous intermediaries, who impose themselves between us and the divine, who say, this is how you will do your spirituality. Uh, you will do it through this preconceived body of knowledge. Uh, you will not have direct revelation. In fact, if you do have direct revelation, until quite recently, we will burn you at the stake. Um, and, and they, they um, talk the talk of you know, peace and love, but the walk they walk is a walk of hatred and fear and suspicion. And I don't think I would be saying anything too controversial to say that it's these three religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that are at the source of so many of the problems in the world today. That the terrible, <laughs> the terrible difficulties, thank you, that, 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 we, that we confront, we are divided from one another by these religions. We're, each one claims to have the sole truth and, and, and to, to make war upon others that, that, that do things a, a, a different way. And let's not look at the talk they talk. Let's look at the walk they walk. Burning people at the stake until the 1700s in, in, in Europe, the whole scandal of pedophile priests in, in uh, the Catholic, Catholic Church, and this ghastly ab abomination of stoning women to death in Islam, you know, for some, for some minor so-called crime. I mean, it's just unbelievable, and all of this being done in the name of God. I can't help thinking, you know, the Gnostics had a point. What kind of God is it that asks people to do this and that people do this in the name of that God? Isn't it more demonic behavior? And then those iconic forces, well, what about the state? You know, the state is another thing that is leading us not to take responsibility for ourselves. The state wants to take responsibility for us, and it wants to use our money to empower itself to take responsibility for us. Uh, I would say the state is another huge force in the world today that is working against the liberation of the human spirit. Uh, and again, it's, this is something that we have to change if we're going to move forward because states operate on fear and hatred and suspicion. They try to make us fearful. They try to make us hate others and suspect others. And this goes on all the time with the, se the security business and the so-called war on terror and all of this mess that's going on in the world today. Uh, this unnecessary division between one person and another. I don't know about you, but personally, I hate and detest patriotism. Why should I be patriotic? Why should I, you know, why should I feel, why should I feel especially attached to somebody because they happen to be born on the same piece of land I was born on or under the same government system? I, I'm interested in communities of ideas. I don't care where somebody was born or what, where, what their ethnicity is. It's completely unimportant to me. And, and, you know, this is one of the things that's used to press our buttons today. You have to be patriotic. Why? Let's be patriotic to the whole human race. Let's not be patriotic to a tiny, <laughs> tiny part of the human race. And uh, so, you know, our society doesn't support, it actually powerfully undermines those who seek to explore states of consciousness that are nurturing to spirit. So I would say we've become a species with amnesia. We're lulled by global iconic culture into, for into forgetfulness of our true nature and purpose here, which ultimately is a spiritual purpose. Far from awake and aware, the controlling powers of our society want us asleep and oblivious. So let's take drugs, you know. Let's take dimethyltryptamine, DMT, a Schedule I drug. Uh, in this country, a Class A drug in Britain. Possession of DMT will get your doors broken down, will get your liberty taken away, will get your reputation destroyed, your chances of getting a job wrecked. Uh, and and what, if this is actually a natural brain hormone. We've all got DMT in our bodies in this room, for God's sake, you know? All of us. It's, it's produced, we now know, in the, in the, in, in the 
pineal gland. Um, uh, it, it was the ancient Egyptian tree of life. But in our society, you smoke DMT and you get caught and you're going to go to prison and your whole life is going to change from, from, there on, from there on in. Whether it's in the smoked form or whether it's in its admixture in, in ayahuasca, the, the sacred brew of the, of the, uh, of the Amazon. Um, I must say, DMT is like a rocket ship to the other side of reality. I mean, <laughs> there is no negotiation with DMT. Uh, it's very quick. You get four hits on that pipe and, and you are gone and you're going to be gone for less than 15 minutes usually and then you're back. But the place you go to is utterly strange and really causes questions to be asked about the nature of reality. Um, I'm not here to advocate drugs. So, so psychedelics are extremely serious business. I'm, what I'm here to advocate is adult responsibility and personal sovereignty. I, I believe, and I've said this many times, that if I live in a society that does not allow me to be sovereign as an adult over my own consciousness, then how can I claim to be free in any useful way? What sort of freedom is there, you know, if... if if I can't make choices right or wrong about, uh, about my own consciousness, and I think this is what's at the heart of the war on drugs, it is a war on consciousness, and, and uh, that we have so many laws that deal with negative behavior towards other already. We don't need new laws that bear down on consciousness in this way. Um, we have to be able to make these decisions uh, about ourselves. I would say that DMT is one of the most challenging experiences that it's possible for a human being to have. Right up there with jumping out of an airplane at 15,000 feet, you know, climbing a mountain, <coughs> so on and so forth. I mean, the last time I smoked DMT, and I, it will be a while before I smoke it again, was in, um, was in uh, late September 2011. And, um, and that's when, as I went under, I heard a voice say, you're ours now. And, I, and my, my last conscious thought was, shit, yes, but only for 12 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> and then I was systematically dismantled and torn apart. And uh, it was but very, very, very thought-provoking. And it was part of the process that led me to uh, a major change in my life that I'll talk about in a moment. Now, our society is not against altered states of consciousness per se. Our society actually encourages the large pharmaceutical companies to make billions of dollars by altering our consciousness in certain agreed ways, with whether it's antidepressants or, or drugs like R Ritalin for hi hyperactivity. I mean, th this is perfectly okay. You know, the billions and billions of dollars are made by big pharma around these drugs, all of which are about altering human consciousness. So there's no argument. No, our society is not against altering consciousness as such. Uh, uh, alcohol. Um, you know, uh, let, let's face it, let's face it, alcohol, alcohol is, you know, probably the most boring drug on the planet. But I, I like, <laughs> you know, but when we, I like a drink myself, I do, but when we drink alcohol, we're not drinking it for the taste, it's being drunk for its effects on consciousness, and alcohol actually is hugely harmful socially. It, it, it causes vast numbers of social harms. And, and makes, makes people very ill, and, and liver damage, and, and road accidents, and all kinds of huge problems associated with alcohol. It's perfectly legal to alter our consciousness in that way. You know, you don't get sent to prison for drinking alcohol. You do get sent to prison if you damage somebody else under the influence of alcohol. And that's right and proper, but I think it should be like that with other, with other drugs uh, as, as well. And again, the al alcohol industry is hugely glamorized in our society. Even tea and coffee, fundamentally, we're drinking those for, or the energy drinks for their effects on consciousness. So I think what it's about is our society particularly values and glorifies the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. That's what we're supposed to be in most of the time. We're allowed to drink alcohol because it's a kind of holiday from the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. We can take Prozac because that will help us to be more efficient in the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. I have nothing against the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. 
As a matter of fact, when I get in an airplane, I would like the pilot to be in an alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. And I would like him to stay in that state of consciousness until he lands the plane. But that doesn't mean it's the only state of consciousness that's valuable to the human race or to that pilot. We are capable of so many other states of consciousness. Our consciousness is this magnificent mystery that science doesn't even begin to understand. Why should we limit it to this narrow bandwidth that our society socially approves? Now, the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, very good for commerce, very good for Wall Street, very good for warfare, uh, very good for the more mundane aspects of science. Although most scientists who make extraordinary discoveries will say that they made those discoveries in some kind of visionary state, not in, a, not in the alert problem-solving state at all. And we've been told that if we just keep investing in this one state of consciousness and accept all other states of consciousness to be demonized, it's okay in our society to make nuclear weapons and, and to invest in them and have huge stockpiles of nuclear weapons, but smoke DMT and you go to jail. <laughs> this is an clearly an insane society that has those kind of priorities and those kind of choices. The sane society would say, if you want to smoke DMT, that's okay, and we'll help you to do it in a safe and nurturing way. And no way on earth will we ever have nuclear weapons because they're dreadful and wrong and a crime, and they should not exist. So we have things upside down. We can't even solve the problem of hunger uh, and the abomination of what is happening in the Amazon. This is, uh, again, a sign that our society has lost contact with its sanity, that we as a global community can stand by as this precious resource, this unbelievable home of biodiversity, uh, the Amazon rainforest is literally destroyed as huge areas are cut down and replanted as soya bean farms to feed cattle so that we can eat hamburgers. I mean, what a ghastly mistake we are making to allow that to occur for a moment. And part of it, a large part of it, is driven by economic need of the peoples in the Amazon basin countries. Um, the, the, this leads to the slash and burn and, 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 and to the destruction of the rainforest. It would be possible as a global community to say to the peoples of the Amazon region, look after the rainforest and we will make it worth your while. We will make it worth your while economically to look after the Amazon rainforest so that there's no need ever to cut down another tree. But we've never been able to do that. We can invest countless billions, trillions in warfare in hatred, fear, and suspicion. We never have a problem in raising money for that. But to raise the relatively small amounts of money that would be needed to make it economically viable not to destroy the Amazon rainforest, that we've never been able to make that choice. So I would say we can't move to a new state of consciousness using the old state of consciousness, which is laden down with arconic constraints. We're going to have to throw off those constraints uh, and transcend the old state of consciousness uh, completely. And Gnosticism, I don't believe, can help us to do that. But oddly enough, I think that shamanism can, uh, because shamanism is a system of direct spiritual knowledge that taps into the same wellsprings uh, and remains very much alive. And the Amazon rainforest remains uh, a, a home of shamanistic knowledge, and indeed of of peoples who have not yet been contacted at all by Western technological culture. There are 150,000 different species of plants and trees uh, in the Amazon, and indigenous shamans have extensive knowledge of their properties. And what I've been told by Amazonian shamans when I've asked them what's wrong with us in, in the West, they say it's really simple. You guys have severed your connection to spirit. If you don't reconnect with spirit, you're going to bring the whole house of cards down on your own heads and on ours. That there's an urgent need to reconnect with spirit. And that's why uh, a remedy is proposed for the sickness of the West. And that remedy is um, ayahuasca, which uh, consists of two principal plants. Uh, this is Cicotria viridis. Uh, a bush that grows in the Amazon. It's called Chacruna in the Amazon, and the leaves contain dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Now, here's the thing about DMT. You can smoke it, but you can't drink it. 
There's an enzyme, I'm sure many in this room, in the room know this, there's an enzyme in our stomachs called monoamine oxidase, which switches off DMT on contact. So if you were to make a tea out of hundreds and hundreds of these leaves, you could drink as much as you liked, and it would only give you a stomach ache. It wouldn't have any psychoactive effects at all because of the monoamine oxidase enzyme in our gut. And this is where an amazing feat of ethnopharmacology has been carried out because the other ingredient of the ayahuasca brew, this is the ayahuasca vine. It means the vine of souls. The other ingredient of the brew, this vine, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. So when you mix together the vine and the leaves and cook them with water, very simple technology this, cook them with water, you end up with a brew in which DMT is orally active. And uh, it doesn't produce a 12 or 15 minute journey like smoked DMT. It produces a four hour journey uh, to the other side of reality. Nice thing about ayahuasca is there's much more negotiation with it than there is with smoked DMT. The matters are not taken entirely out of your hands. Uh, and you go in and out of the journey. Uh, and it becomes possible to reflect on it in some ways. For those who've drunk ayahuasca in this room, this will be a, a rather shudderingly awful sight at the moment. <laughs> uh, because the, uh, I, mean, I think, you know, we all know I ayahuasca tastes ghastly, <laughs> dreadful taste. Um, I've drunk ayahuasca a bit more than 50 times now, um, and I still find, and in fact, I find it worse every time that I drink it. <laughs> So what I would say is um, essence of old socks, um, raw sewage, uh, some battery acid, a bit of sulfur, and just a hint of chocolate. <laughs> that is the taste of ayahuasca. And uh, when you drink it, um, you know immediately that something formidable has passed your lips. I, I hold my nose when I drink it. Uh, and hope for the best. And, and uh, initially, you're okay. You can walk around for a while, 10, 15 minutes. But after that, you're going to want to sit down or lie down. You prefer the lights to be out. After 40 minutes or so, this, these effects wear off a bit the more you drink ayahuasca. I don't vomit every time now. I don't have diarrhea every time I drink ayahuasca. But yes, it is called the purge in the Amazon. It does cause diarrhea and vomiting. So let's not pretend that anybody's drinking ayahuasca for fun. It's not recreation. You have to brace yourself for an ayahuasca journey. It is, it's a serious, serious endeavor. It requires real commitment. Um, and and uh, you're going to feel a bit dizzy. Uh, and, and the first time I drank it in the Amazon, you know, I mean, I'm British and we're very inhibited. And the prospect of having to, you know, jump behind a tree and tear down my trousers was almost too... <laughs> almost too much to bear. But, but that, was the, that was the first lesson that ayahuasca taught me, that our bodies are actually the least important part of ourselves. And the, you know, we, have, we have this thing called our spirit, our consciousness. And at the level of consciousness, what is happening with ayahuasca is absolutely amazing. Uh, this, this extraordinary entry into an enchanted, mysterious realm, which the paintings of Pablo Amaringo, uh, an ayahuasca shaman, who passed away, sadly, a couple of years ago, give some indication of the, the nature of this realm. It really doesn't matter whether you drink ayahuasca in Tokyo or New York or, or, or the Amazon. You're going to enter this, this enchanted realm of experience uh, filled with these sentient beings. And um, this is the work of Robert, uh, the late Robert Venosa, who worked out of Boulder, uh, Colorado, greatly influenced by ayahuasca. And here's some of the paintings of Alex Gray, uh, whose Chapel of the Sacred Mirrors is, is in upstate New York. Uh, many artists have had their work transformed by the experience of drinking ayahuasca. I can't paint to save my life, but it was ayahuasca that made me start writing novels, right or wrong, in <laughs> 2010. Um, I, I uh, found a, a creative impulse in that, in, in that direction. And, and ayahuasca has a very insistent message uh, and it's one of those universals of the ayahuasca experience. And it's about this sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and of the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. And the spirit of ayahuasca, this is another interesting thing. And this is another area where I got into trouble with Ted. I tried to say very clearly 
that I cannot prove that I am actually encountering some kind of goddess in these visionary states. It may all be a projection of my own mind. I make no claims to the reality status of that entity that many, many thousands of people around the world are now calling the grandmother or Mother Ayahuasca. The fact that other people also encounter her does not prove that she's real. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, this is the phenomenology of the ayahuasca experience, and it's particularly common amongst Westerners to encounter this female entity who sometimes appears as a woman, in radiant in her power, sometimes appears as a serpent, sometimes appears as a jaguar. She's a, a shapeshifter. Uh, she transforms her appearance. Some of the tribes in the Amazon see her as a, as a male entity. Many others see her as, as, as female. Is she just a projection of our own minds, or is there something going on here? Is, is the receiver wavelength of the brain being altered in this deeply altered state of consciousness, and we're gaining access to some other dimension of reality where some intelligent entity resides? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I know that for me, at the level of experience, I understand what the Greeks felt like when they talked about meeting Athena. You know, it's like that. For me, there's a reality to this entity. When she has appeared to me in the visionary state and said to me, you need to surrender if I'm going to work with you. And I've got that message. When she's wrapped herself around me in the form of a huge serpent, this has seemed very real to me. <laughs> I don't know if she's real or not, but in her consequences, she is, she is real, a healer, a, a, a creative guide, and a, and a moral teacher. Very often, you will hear people crying in ayahuasca ceremonies. Why? Because they have been confronted with the truth about their behavior at different times in their life, the pain they've caused to others, the suffering that they have needlessly inflicted through a harsh word or deed, suddenly comes back to them, seen from the other person's point of view. It's like a life review. It's very similar to the near-death experience, uh, that you get the chance to see your life from a completely different perspective with all the veils stripped away in utter, honest, stark, transparent truth. Uh, ayahuasca has been so successful in getting people off addictions to hard drugs, drugs like uh, heroin and cocaine. I'm not saying it's a miracle cure, but what I'm saying is that there, there is consistent testimony for many, many years now that people with addiction issues can be helped by ayahuasca. Jacques Mabit at the Takiwasi Clinic in Tarapoto in, in Peru is bringing heroin and cocaine addicts typically for a month. They have 12 ayahuasca sessions. Huge numbers of them, more than half, leave free of addiction uh, without withdrawal symptoms. They've had a revelation during their ayahuasca journeys where they've understood the source of the problem and the need to change it, and they, and, and they, they, they do change it. Um, Dr. Gabor Mate in Canada had a very successful practice with ayahuasca and drug addicts. Um, I mean, forget about methadone and all that shit, you know. Ayahuasca really does the business. But Jacques Mabit was stopped working in Canada. Why? Because they said ayahuasca is a drug. Well, I was never addicted to heroin or cocaine. If you've seen my TED talk, you know what's coming next. <laughs> this is where I... Uh, and, and I want to preface it by saying I don't want any misunderstanding. I am not against cannabis. I think cannabis can be a wonderful ally. I think it can be a wonderful healing ally, and I think it can be a, a wonderful sensual ally, and a spiritual and a creative ally as well. And cannabis, for many years, played a very positive role in my life. But I, over a long period of time, over 24 years, developed an abusive relationship with cannabis. It was not the fault of the herb. It was my fault. It was my mistake. I did not use that herb respectfully. When I first started smoking cannabis, it was 1987. I came to it really late. I was 37 years old at the time. Most people start, you know, much younger than that. But I was 37, and I was a journalist, and I was into current affairs and all that kind of stuff. And then one friend in Somalia, another friend in London, in the same year, offered me cannabis, and I started smoking it, and I really liked it. 
And, and I think, actually, to be perfectly honest, I don't think that I would ever have written my books of historical mystery if I had not encountered cannabis. I think it was very, very helpful to me in, in shifting me out of a rigid pattern of behavior and shifting me into another. Initially, I smoked cannabis at evenings and weekends. That's what I was doing when I wrote The Sign and the Seal. But then when I started working on Fingerprints of the Gods in sort of late 1992 into 93, I thought, why don't I experiment with smoking cannabis all day? <laughs> and, and, and um, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> initially, <laughs> in, initially smoking. Later, one of, my, one of my kids persuaded me to use a vaporizer, uh, explaining that, that combustion products were not helpful to me at the level I was smoking. Uh, but that if I took it as steam, it would be much better. And so for many, many years, I was just permanently stoned. Um, and, and I was permanently stoned when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods. And that's why my, my critics, when they hear this, say that's why it's such a shit book, because he smoked <laughs> dope all the time. Um, but, but I was quite functional. I didn't get dreamy. I didn't get lost. I was able to maintain focus. And I was able to write 16 hours a day stoned. I would fire up the vaporizer at you know, 9 o'clock in the morning and switch it off at 2 o'clock the next morning, seven days a week. Um, and in a way, work became an excuse to smoke dope all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I, from the moment I started drinking ayahuasca in 2003, I started getting messages that I needed to adjust my cannabis habit. And the messages were fairly stern and fairly strict, and I completely ignored them. And I ignored them for years and years and years and years and years. And people who know me or knew me at that time would know that I would plan my journeys around the world around if I could get cannabis or not. If I couldn't get it in a particular country, I wouldn't go there. Um, it was that important to me. And, you know, I had friends in all kinds of different places who would meet me with a little stash to see me through. So I was very dependent upon it. And, and I felt that I actually couldn't function without it. And I felt that I couldn't write without it. And that my life had no meaning without it. In other words, I was completely, yeah, I was completely addicted to cannabis. Um, and, and gradually, as time went by, it went from the smiley face to this face. And I became more and more crazy and paranoid and suspicious. I never trusted anybody. I approached everybody with intense suspicion, including my beautiful wife and partner, Santa, wh whose life I made a misery. Uh, and finally, I had that DMT trip in September 2011 where they said, you're ours now, and where they then tore me apart for 12 minutes, which felt like a thousand years. And then I got on a plane and I flew down to Brazil and I had five ayahuasca sessions in a period of two weeks. And in those five sessions, I was given a horrendous kicking by the entity that I call Mother Ayahuasca. Now, I don't believe in hell, but this was the kind of place she took me to, um, which is um, Hieronymus Bosch, you know, uh, this awful place this awful realm that I was taken to. And it was a bit like that, and it was a bit like the Judgment Hall of Osiris. And I was shown that if I carried on down the path of behavior that I was continuing on, I would in some way be doomed. I would be found wanting in the judgment. Uh, I would not be justified. I would not have used the gift of human life well. And uh, the result was that when I got back to England, I was determined to moderate my relationship with cannabis. I would only smoke it at evenings and weekends again. Very first thing I did when I got off the plane was fire up the vaporizer and fill that bag. And that's when I found I could never smoke cannabis again because I was just filled with such horror and revulsion. Um, something had happened to me during those ayahuasca sessions and I was literally unable to continue smoking. So I expressed the steam from the bag and I got rid of my six ounces of grass, and I got rid of my three vaporizers, <laughs> and, and that was October 2011, and it's two years later, and, and I haven't smoked cannabis again. And, and, um, <laughs> and I say that, again, wanting to emphasize that that's my story. I, I believe that cannabis is an ally, that it can be incredibly helpful. I think my mistake was to abuse it. I think I needed to use it right, and I didn't. I didn't use it right. So I don't put down others for, for smoking cannabis at all. 
Uh, I'm just telling that in my case, I received a healing that I desperately needed, and that healing came through the ayahuasca experience. Now, ayahuasca is part of a carefully preserved and protected body of knowledge that is outside our conic control. Uh, and that is shamanism, and the essence of all shamanism is altered states of consciousness, trance states. They're the universal feature of shamanism. Uh, and in these altered states of consciousness, it's very common for shamans to report encounters with intelligent supernatural entities, which are normally construed as spirits. And they can sometimes take human form, uh, or they can take animal form, or they can appear as a therianthrope. That's from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos, which means man, beast, beast men, beast, ma creatures that are part animal and part human in form. And, and shamans in all cultures also report that they themselves transform into these entities uh, when they enter the trance state and journey into the spirit world. And here's a, a mystery that I want to consider and uh, that I've talked about quite a bit over the years, which is that the, the experiences that shamans report with spirits are very similar to the encounters with quote-unquote aliens reported by tens of thousands of people in the West who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. And I want to consider these two supposedly very different domains of the alien and the spirit. In, indeed, the shamans themselves frequently uh, depict UFOs uh, and aliens. You can see these UFOs up here in Pablo Amaringo's painting. And when I asked Pablo about the constant presence of UFOs uh, in, his, uh, in his images, uh, like, like this one here, um, I said, are, they, are these beings from other planets who are visiting us in these, in these flying saucers? And he said, actually, no, they're not. He said, the flying saucers are vehicles for entering and leaving the spirit world. And when a shaman talks about the spirit world, that's a bit like a quantum physicist talking about a parallel dimension. And it made me start to wonder whether, whether this very real UFO experience is but perhaps we're jumping hastily to the conclusion that it's high-tech beings a bit like us from the other side of the galaxy crossing interstellar space. Maybe it's even more mysterious than that. Maybe these are interdimensional visitors who we are encountering uh, and construing as, uh, as aliens. At any rate, if you want to know about shamanism, big dossier of work on the phenomenology of shamanism, read Mircea Aliad's uh, vast tome on shamanism, which recounts the experiences of shamans all around the world. And for aliens, John Mack, who was professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, unfortunately killed in a, uh, by a drunk driver in London in 2004. John was a friend of mine, wonderful man. Um, he uh, began to take the experiences of UFO abductees seriously. People would come to him very troubled in his practice and report the experience of being abducted by UFOs and, and aliens. And uh, rather than dismissing them as mad, as a matter of fact, he conducted personality tests and found them to be completely sane. Rather than dismissing them as mad, John took their accounts seriously. As a result of which, Harvard University, where he was professor of psychiatry, tried to fire him. Um, because you're not allowed to take things like UFOs and aliens seriously in mainstream academe. Uh, and with uh, a great lawyer called Danny Sheehan, John fought this uh, action with Harvard University, and he was able to keep his job. But he told me in an, e in an email that he had subsequently been banished, this was how he spoke, to what he called the ontological and epistemological wilderness by his colleagues, who would pass him in the corridors of Harvard um, as though he were invisible. We can compare these two domains, UFO abductions and, and shamans and spirits. Well, the shamans frequently encounter spirits in the form of animals, birds, and fish, uh, not just greys. And uh, UFO abductees very frequently encounter the alien in animal form as well, whether a deer or a wolf. And John summarizes the aliens appear to be consummate shapeshifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, owls, eagles, Raccoons and deer are among the creatures the abductees have seen initially. Shamans report being floated up into the sky or climbing threads or ropes of light. Uh, so do shamans. They report exactly the same thing. You can see depictions of that in San Rock Art in South Africa. Uh, and uh, you can see that UFO abductees report threads or ropes of light as well.
So these two domains seem very similar. Some shamans are abducted into the sky, some are abducted underground or underwater. Same goes for UFO abductees, not only into the sky, but sometimes underwater or into crystalline caverns with stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, and then there's the shamanic ordeal, which is the universal feature of all shamanism. The shaman is abducted by the spirits, the spirits uh, impale him with spears or nails or knives or, or may cut off his or her head or arms or legs or, or may insert rock crystals and other objects uh, into the body of the shaman. Uh, Mercia Aliad's book is full of accounts of that. And again, what is the most common feature of the UFO abduction experience is surgery at the hands of the aliens. Uh, and if you look at this, I mean, there's the Yakut shaman cited by Eliad. The spirits cut off his head, which they set aside. Sandra Larson is abducted by a UFO. Beings removed her brain and set it down beside her. Even bone counting is common to both domains. So it's very odd, these, these similarities. Then there's the, the business of sex with spirits. Shamans are, are always having sex with spirits. I know a shaman whose wife has left him <laughs> because of his lover in the spirit world. He's even got kids with her. And UFO abductees, too, they, they report sex with aliens all the time. Lots and lots of sex is going on with aliens. And there are hybrid babies, and the abductee may be reabducted multiple times to nurture that baby in the alien world. So what's going on here? Why are these realms so similar? There's the 12th century Rupertsburg Codex. This is uh, Alex Gray's painting of a DMT experience. Eyes are very common in the DMT experience. There they are in the Rupertsburg Codex. And there's some kind of impregnation going on from the celestial realm. Uh, into the womb of, womb of this woman here. And look up there, there's this little elf or gnome, and what's he holding if not a mushroom? <laughs> you know? Uh, rather similar iconography here to the Cash Landrum UFO sighting as, as well. And what on earth is going on here? Ert de Gelder, circa 1710. That's a, that's a flying saucer in the sky there in 1710. And, and, and the, you know, the, what's, what's happening here? This is baptism of Christ or, or shamanic initiation? Very, very strange imagery there to, to understand. And, and then what about books? Maria Sabina, um, famous me Mexican shaman, is given a book by a spirit. And she learned many things from the book that would help her to do her work and help people to, uh, to, to know the secrets of the world where everything is known. But Maria was not allowed to keep that book. It stayed in the sky. Betty Hill, abducted by a UFO in 1961, she's given a book by the leader of the aliens, but he reclaims it before she's allowed to leave the ship. Betty Andreasen is given a small blue book with 40 luminous pages, but soon afterwards it disappeared. Um, and UFO abductees and shamans often return from the experience with a sense of mission, with the feeling that they have healing powers, something to do. And then these things, fairies and elves, what about them? What are they all about? And why do they have so much in common with aliens and spirits? Uh, and here I want to pay tribute to the work of Jacques Vallée. This is a very important book, Passport to Magonia, published in 1969. In my book, Supernatural, uh, I took the dossier of evidence that Vallée presented in 1969, and I took it forward into the 2000s, uh, because he, he stopped that research in 69. But he was the first person to draw attention to the uncanny similarities at the level of phenomenology between fairies and aliens. What were fairies in the business of? Abduction. All the time. You did not want to get close to the fairy dance, this whirling circle in the fields of dancing fairies. You get close to that, touch it, and you're going to be just drawn suddenly, in an instant, into another world. And in that other world, you might be entertained by the fairies. You might even make love with the fairies. You might spend what you think is a pleasant three or four hours there. And then eventually, they'll let you go home. When you get home, you discover that 400 years have passed. <laughs> Rather extreme form of what I would say is called the missing time phenomenon in uh, UFO abductions today, except now it's just four hours that you lose, not 400 years. 
And sometimes I wonder in flights of fancy, is the UFO, is the technology developing in that other world too? Is the UFO the latest form of the fairy dance, this whirling, spinning thing that transports you into another world? Fairies could be cruel, tortured and hurt human beings, just like aliens, just like spirits, but they also were kind, they gave gifts, they bestowed healing powers. They had the power of flight, they used aerial vehicles, flying boats, flying castles, flying carriages, etc. Uh, fairies would abduct us into caves and underground, just like spirits, just like aliens. Look at these two pictures. What do they have in common? Mushrooms in both. Amanita muscaria, probably psilocybes down here. The fairies are beckoning us into the hollow hills. Uh, and like aliens and spirits, fairies and elves often appear in the form of animals or as therianthropes, like these therianthropes from this Dutch woodcut in the 15th century, part animal, part human in form, fairies. Melusine, feared medieval fairy, part serpent, part woman. And this theme of the serpent man or, or woman is a universal theme that's just echoed down human history forever. It's a subdivision of the therianthropic theme, like Theseus slaying the Minotaur. What is the Minotaur if not a classic therianthrope? Here's a bull man wrestling with a lion from Akkad in 1800 BC. All of the Egyptian gods are therianthropes, part animal, part human in form. The oldest surviving piece of cave art from anywhere in the world, from Fumani Cave in Italy, is a therianthrope. Head and horns of a bull, body of a human being. Uh, Hollenstein Stadel Cave in Germany, 32,000 years old, a lion man. And these bison men are all over the painted caves of France and Spain for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. What are we looking at here? How do we explain this sort of thing, the sorcerer, part stag, part horse, part wolf, part owl, part human. Where do these kind of ideas come from? Just from the fevered imagination of the artist or from some kind of experience? Uh, the cave art is the, the earliest expressions of such ideas in human culture. If we look at this image from Chauvet Cave, this bison man, and we pull back to see the whole image, we can get a sense of what's going on. Bison man is straddling a woman, a large female figure. But weirdly, she's headless, except that her right arm here is transforming into the head of a lion. So this is not somebody dressed up in skins. This is a transformation that's being depicted 32,000 years ago on the walls of Chauvet Cave. This is a, a, a moment of shape-shifting. And where in daily life do we have experiences like this? Not out hunting animals on the plains. Where we have experiences of transformation is in deeply altered states of consciousness, in trance states, uh, like these images of humans transforming into antelopes from the Cedarberg in South Africa, or this amazing pair of eland men with the heads of elands and the bodies of human beings, this one with two serpents wrapped around his body, each serpent also has the head of an antelope, this one with feathers growing out of his back. I mean, again, this is not something you see every day, but it's something that you do see in deeply altered states of consciousness, and you do see it quite commonly in deeply altered states of consciousness. Look at these strange figures from Los Casares Cave in Spain, uh, or this curious figure from Angoulême in France 27,000 years ago, and this one from Peche Merle, uh, in, uh, in, in France, 24,000 years old, that high domed forehead, narrow pointed chin, large dark eyes and some weird object hovering in the sky above it. Uh, we've had a redrawing done of that and I must say he does look a lot like a grey as we see them today. Uh, also there are images that the archaeologists can't say what they are on the walls of Altamira and Bernifal, for example, but they're pretty much identical to Pablo Amaringo's flying saucers from his ayahuasca visions. Uh, one of these three images was done by one of John Mack's patients in 1990. She said every time she was about to be abducted, the aliens would project this image into her visual field. It was a warning that an abduction was coming. Uh, the other two are from the painted caves more than 24,000 years ago. That's the modern image, and those are the ancient images. I would say the same inspiration in all cases. To cut a long story very short indeed, the explanation for all of this 
and this is really why I came to write my book, Supernatural, um, is uh, to be found in the work of Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He had a long struggle with academia uh, to get his point of view accepted, but I would say today it is the mainstream view in academia, that what we're looking at in the cave art is an art of visions. It's a shamanistic art, that those ancient artists were shamans, that they were entering deeply altered states of consciousness. They were painting on the cave walls when they returned to a normal state of consciousness what they had seen in the visionary state. And this is manifested in the patterns, in the imagery, in the therianthropes, everything about it. Here is some of David's important work. I highly recommend The Mind in the Cave. He draws on uh, scientific research where, where volunteers were given hallucinogens in the, s in the 50s, 60s, 70s and, and comes up with various stages in trance and the typical imagery that's seen in those stages and the sense of it passing through a vortex into a seamlessly convincing parallel realm. And finally here, a volunteer under the influence of mescaline uh, in the 1960s draws a man in a modern business suit with the head of a fox. No different in principle from the lion men from, or, the, or the bison men from the painted caves of ancient Europe. And so David Williams, Lewis Williams' point is that the, the art itself bears evidence that those ancient artists were using visionary plants. But in case we were in any doubt, New Scientist has recently trumpeted the earliest evidence for magic mushroom use in Europe because we see Psilocybe Hispanica on the walls of this cave painting from Spain. Uh, this is what I call six million years of boredom, the um, gradual evolution from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee through until anatomically modern humans. First stone tools invented 2.5 million years ago. Believe me, you wouldn't have wanted to have dinner with these guys. They were very boring. I doubt if they would have had much conversation. Once they made those stone tools, they stuck with them without any change for the next million years. What does this tell us? Two things. Firstly, they are passing on cultural information. Secondly, they are not innovating. They are not making any change. They are locked in a rigid pattern of behavior dependent on a particular technology. Anything familiar about that? When change is introduced, the Acheulean, that new tool type sticks for another million years. And this goes on even after our ancestors become anatomically modern around 195,000 years ago. The earliest anatomically modern human skeletons so far found from Ethiopia 195,000 years ago. You could pass such a person in the subway, you wouldn't notice anything. They looked just like us. But their behavior was not like ours. It continued to be archaic, continued to lack innovation, any sign of spirituality, any sign of symbolism, and really the first massive change begins after 100,000 years ago, and really it begins with the introduction of cave art less than 50,000 years ago. This is when suddenly we recognize that we are dealing with ourselves. This is when the great symbolic art is introduced. This is when huge other changes accompany the introduction of the cave art. Now, here's the logic. We know now that the cave art was the result of our ancestors embracing visionary experiences, embracing altered states of consciousness. In other words, using psychedelics. I'm not saying psychedelics are the only way to get into altered states of consciousness. There are many other techniques that have been developed since, but that encounter with psychedelics seems to have been key to our ancestors because it wasn't just the art, everything changed. Evidence for spirituality, burial of the dead with grave goods, which tells us that our ancestors believed that some aspect of the individual survived death, um, it's possible that this is when language first, first, uh, first appeared. Terence McKenna, I must pay tribute to the amazing foresight of Terence McKenna. <laughs> the, amazing, the amazing foresight of Ter Terence McKenna with his, with his stoned ape theory. As, as so often was the case, Terence absolutely hit the truth, hit the nail on the head right there. These psychedelics played an absolutely fundamental role in the emergence of modern humanity. And David Lewis Williams just came at it from a different direction with his academic research. Um, and, you know, it's not just then. There's Francis Crick, the discoverer of the double helix. Francis Crick's little secret 
was the use of LSD. Francis Crick admitted to a reporter uh, that he first saw the double helix shape while on LSD. It wasn't the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. It wasn't the beer in the Eagle, Eagle Pub in Cambridge. It was acid. <laughs> and Francis Crick was using acid perfectly legally because he felt that it was a stimulant to his creative efforts. So a very important scientific discovery, key in the modern world, we now know bore a relationship to visionary states of consciousness. What about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak? You know, Steve Jobs... Um, spoke about how taking LSD was one of the two or three most important things he'd done in his life. And wishing to surround himself with people of similar mindset, he would often ask interviewees how many times they'd taken LSD. <laughs> the 70s, the 60s, the, the whole connection between the developing psychedelic world and, the, and the, the computer scene was especially apparent at that time. The music of the period, everything. In a way, it was an aborted revolution. Things went, things went awry, things went wrong, and it sparked off the war on drugs. But I don't think we can deny that these visionary plants, these visionary substances, are not simply brain candy. Used in the right way, they can be transformative, and they have been transformative again and again throughout human history. Again, I repeat, I'm not here to advocate drugs. I'm here to advocate adult responsibility. I'm here to ad advocate adult sovereignty over consciousness. And one of the issues of being sovereign over our own consciousness is the right, if we wish to do so in a responsible way, to explore the mysteries of consciousness that psychedelics unleash. It's good that science is beginning to go back into the water here, that new research is being done with psilocybin, with MDNA, M MDMA, uh, to, w w which is showing the I important therapeutic benefits for these previously reviled and demonized so-called drugs. Uh, the, the mystical experiences that are, that, that are reliably produced by psilocybin. Imagine if the vicar in the church could guarantee that at least half of his congregation would have the single most important experience in their lives that, morning in, that Sunday morning in church, uh, which you, you can have with psilocybin. And psilocybin and DMT are very closely related. In fact, psilocybin is often described as orally active DMT. And that's why I want to close with a quick review of Rick Strassman's work at the University of New Mexico with dimethyltryptamine in the 1990s. Rick Strassman amazingly got permission from the Drugs Enforcement Agency to give DMT to human volunteers in a program that lasted about five years at the University of New Mexico. And I would say that Rick Strassman's book is DMT, The Spirit Molecule. If you haven't read it, read it. It's an incredibly important book. And this work that Rick Strassman did uh, has profound implications for the nature of reality. Uh, one of the things he found that about half of his volunteers, they were not being abducted by aliens physically because they were right there on the hospital bed in the University of New Mexico. But their consciousness was being abducted by aliens. And uh, half of them reported experiences that were very like the UFO abduction experiences. So probes being inserted into their minds. Ben feels something being inserted into his left forearm. Carl encounters a lot of prankish, ornery elves. Lucas says, there's nothing that can prepare you for this. There was a space station below me and to my right. I was also aware of many entities inside the space station. They were doing some kind of routine technological work and paid no attention to me. Um, sometimes th 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 there were four or five of them. They were on me fast. They weren't benevolent, but they weren't non-benevolent, they rapidly probed. This was, I can't draw, as you can see, but this was my experience with aliens under the influence of ayahuasca. That was when I'm sitting in the Peruvian jungle on a bench, and I've drunk a lot of ayahuasca, and suddenly I become aware of these UFOs in the sky above me, and then I see this gray with these kind of cross-hatched insect-like eyes, and I know that he's going to abduct me. And I'm terrified. And I open my eyes and I say, no! <laughs> and he goes away. What I should have done was keep my eyes closed and say, yes! <laughs> I should have had the courage to say yes. 
and go with that experience and see where it took me. As a matter of fact, that particular experience has never come back to me with ayahuasca again. I very much regret uh, my fear at that time uh, overwhelming me. Um, there's uh, another of Rick's volunteers. I was in an alien laboratory. There were beings. They had a space ready for me, insect creatures, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, a number of Rick Strassman's volunteers said the same thing. This is, this is really thought-provoking. They encountered beings who said to them, we're so glad you've discovered this technology. Now we can communicate with you more easily. Think about that. DMT is a kind of technology for communicating across, across dimensions. Uh, as I said, it's a natural brain hormone. Uh, the new research is more and more bearing out Rick's original notion that it's produced in the pineal gland, which is the third eye, uh, which indeed in evolutionary older animals actually has a lens, a cornea, and a retina. It doesn't in human beings. It's moved deeper into the brain, but maybe it's still a sense organ. Maybe DMT is the lens, and maybe it's a kind of sixth sense. Maybe it's allowing us to make contact with a much wider, more extended Reality And what Strassman is suggesting, to cut a long story short, is that UFO abductees may be people who spontaneously overproduce DMT. This is not to say I would not be doing Rick's work justice if I then suggested that that means their experiences are not real. He is suggesting that their experiences are absolutely real, but that we need to widen our definition of what reality is. Back to this issue as the brain as a receiver rather than as a generator of consciousness. Uh, and Rick points out that most of us, most of the time, are tuned into what he calls channel normal. But many other channels may be broadcasting at us, which our receiver cannot pick up. Maybe what DMT does is to adjust the receiver wavelength of the brain to allow us to gain access to that wider reality. And the analogy I like to give here, because when I put this to materialist scientists, they say stuff and nonsense, complete rubbish you're talking absolute crap. Of course it's not like that. Um, the brain makes consciousness. And they say, look, I can give you DMT, why are you up to an MRI scanner, and I will witness certain changes in your brain on the MRI scanner to the electricity and the chemistry of your brain. And what you, those visions you're having, they're just those changes in your brain. Just those physical changes in your brain. It's just your brain on drugs. There's no reality to them at all. We humans, we can't see stuff without interpreting it. Interpretation and perception, they all happen at the same moment. What I'm suggesting is fairies, spirits, aliens, that in all these cases, we're looking at the very same ancient and long-lived phenomenon of human visionary experience seen through different cultural spectacles. And that from time to time, down the millennia, this experience has brought us the forbidden fruit of Gnosis and reawakened us to the true nature of things. And that's why I'd like to close with just looking at the Garden of Eden again. And interestingly, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent is almost always depicted as a therianthrope, part animal, part human in form, a classic entity of the visionary realm, in other words. And uh, let's remember what happened to us. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life. I think in all this somewhere the mystery of knowledge of good and evil and the mystery of immortal life lies concealed. Thank you. <laughs>